passage. Father, we have just sung or um, given voice to those uh, words, ready to do your will. And Father, we pray that that would indeed be our, the attitude of our hearts this morning, that you'd help us to listen to your word, to submit ourselves under your word, and so be ready to do your will. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work amongst us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, please do have uh, 1 Thessalonians open in, in front of you. And we're not going to be looking at every aspect of uh, that, that reading. In fact, we're really going to be concentrating on verse 11. Um, but we are going to look at the context as well. It was lovely, wasn't it, last Sunday uh, to get all of that snow. Uh, even if you don't really like snow um, and don't like being in it because it's cold, it was still nice to look at. And I think it put everyone in a good mood. After church, the girls and I went out and we started to make a snowman. So we rolled the snow into giant uh, balls. But then was the challenge. How are we going to get one of these great big balls onto the top of the other for the body? And I thought, you know, I can do this. So I bent down. And I couldn't, I couldn't move that great hulk of snow on my own. So I had to bury my manly pride and I asked for help. And you know, with all four of us, we could just about lift that ball of snow onto the other and our snowman was born. And in a church family, the work of discipling each other, it shouldn't be left to just one person. We are a family. We are a body. Maybe you've tried to move something really heavy yourself, you know, like a piano or something. And you know, you don't just move, if it's really heavy, you don't just pick it up with one hand. Your whole body goes into it. Imagine moving that piano. You're pushing with all your body. All the muscles throughout your entire body are engaged in that exercise. And so we saw in Ephesians last week that the whole body plays its part. The body grows and builds itself up in love and becomes mature in Christ as all the body plays its part. So maturity is the aim of the body here and maturity is to be like Jesus. As individuals we, we might wonder, well what on earth can I do? But together is as together we begin to faithfully flex our spiritual gifts and serve each other in the power of the Holy Spirit is then the church will grow and become like Jesus. Even if you think your bit is quite insignificant, actually it's as you do your bit that the church grows and builds itself up in love. We didn't really explore too much of the practical aspects, so I think uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do a little bit more of that this morning. Uh, we're going to build on where we left off as we look at this passage, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So as we come to think about uh, the work of encouraging and building the work, uh, building the body of Christ, we need to make, make sure that our eyes are on the prize, that we know what lays before us, uh, that we know um, where we're going. That's the pattern that we've set in our vision. First, we look at the Lord and then we look at other things. That's the pattern that Paul sets in this, in this letter too. He points us towards Jesus and then talks about what we need to do. So our first point this morning is remember that Jesus is coming back. Remember, Jesus is coming back. There's always lots of speculation about when Jesus is going to return. But Paul says he's not going to write about dates and, and times. And that should stop us getting taken in by people that speculate and have all these different theories about, you know, I think they've worked it out. If Paul didn't know, and we don't know. So let's not waste our time thinking we think it's going to be da 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 whenever. In fact, he says Jesus is going to come back like a thief in the night. This world is going to be going about its business. It'll wake up just like it did today. It'll be just like any other day. And then 
Jesus will return. Unexpected for all to see. There will be loudness. There will be angels. There will be glory. There will be no missing Jesus when he returns. So that will be the unbelievers who aren't expecting him. But as believers, that day when Jesus returns, that's not going to be like a thief in the night for us. That's what he says. You see, the thing about a thief is he doesn't announce himself in advance. He creeps in. He takes your stuff. And he's gone. And if you hear him in the night, oh, what panic there is, isn't there? Oh, I think there's someone in the house. Oh, you better go and check. Why me? <laughs> you know, but, you know, it's, it's horrible. It's scary. It's unexpected. And that's what Paul is saying to those who are in the darkness, to unbelievers. This is going to be shocking. This is going to be scary. Jesus is going to be suddenly there. But to believers who are in the light, it won't be an unexpected thing. He's not going to be like that thief because we are expecting him, aren't we? I, I hope we're expecting Jesus to come back. But, but we don't know the precise time or the precise day. So there will be an element of surprise, but it's not going to be completely unexpected. It's the same sort of thing as when you're expecting someone to pop around to your house sometime in the day. They say, oh, yeah, I'll pop in at some point in the day. You don't know precisely when, but the bell rings. And you go, oh, right, yeah, they're here. So there is a difference. Those who are in the light, we are expecting him. But to those in the darkness, it will be as unexpected as a thief. So as those expecting Jesus to return any day, that should affect our lives. This is what Paul is saying in verses 6 and 8, 6 to 8. Uh, Since we're in the light, our behaviour should be fitting for the sort of thing that goes on in the day. So whereas those people who are in the darkness in the night, they tend to, to sleep and that's the time you sort of get drunk and all sorts of shady things go on, all those things associated with the, the, the night and with, with darkness. But since we belong to the day, our behaviour should, should fit with the things of the day. So honest dealings, things that are, can be seen. Um, uh, so, so, so things that are, are open and honest, things that happen in the daylight. So we should be sober, he says. Now, uh, that, that is talking about drunkenness, but it's not the main purpose. It's metaphorical, really, there. So it's, it's about being ready, it's about being calm, it's about being steady, it's about being sane, able to think clearly, able to think wisely. That's what he's saying. And then he says, obviously, in, in verse 6, he says, um, let us not sleep. Now, obviously, we're not meant to take that literally. Again, it's a metaphor. Um, our lives are not to be lived as if Jesus wasn't returning and so we just fill ourselves with all kinds of sin we're not to be dull and not thinking and and, and just spending our time um, distracted by sin and the deeds of the darkness and we are to spend our time doing what people do in the day and that is getting ready living as we should helping others get ready too so i wonder as we've seen those two contrasts there the deeds of the darkness just do all those shady things that we know belong to, to those, those sorts of worlds. And then we've got the, the living in the light and living to please Jesus, living in openness, honesty, anticipation, readiness. I wonder if we ourselves are living in the light of Jesus' return. The senior pastor of um, Street Baptist Church, the, the uh, church I was at formerly, uh, I used to work with him, obviously. Um, he preached his final sermon there on the 27th of uh, December, and he was looking forward to retirement. But this Monday, totally unexpected, just one month later, he went to be with the Lord. He wasn't expecting that. He didn't know the time and date. And we don't know the time and dates of our lives, the time and dates of Jesus' return. So does the fact that we will meet Jesus face to face one day, does that impact how we are living now? At a Thessalonian church, it was a young church. Paul had declared the gospel to them 
uh, in chapter 2 verse 2 we see that that was a, amidst uh, great conflict in chapter 2 verse 14 we see that they were suffering for their faith so, so there was a there was a difficult situation they were in there was persecution and in all this persecution <clears throat> and suffering they are to remember that Jesus is coming back he is coming back and so they are to love, they are to live accordingly, because Jesus is coming back. This isn't just going to carry on forever and ever. He's coming back. That should affect us now. So not only does that mean living to please God, chapter 4, verse 1, it also means protecting themselves with spiritual armor, because we are in a war. There's all sorts of things going on in this world, deeds of darkness. We are in a war, so we need to protect ourselves with spiritual uh, armour. That's what he says here. So there's the breastplate of faith and love. Oh, just quickly, that, 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 that means to trust firmly in the promises of God, to put our faith in him. That is what protects us by putting our faith in him. It means we rely on his great love for us, what he is doing for us holding on to his love, holding on to his promises, that will provide the protection when the world attacks us, when life is so difficult, when we are grinding through and we think, oh, is there ever going to be any end to this? We hold on to, with faith to his promises. We hold on to his love. We trust in him. And then there's the uh, helmet of hope. Sounds slightly comical, doesn't it? Really? The helmet of hope. Would you pass me a new helmet of hope, please? I've seem to have misplaced my, my, my helmet. But what, what is this helmet of, of love? Uh, sorry, hope. Um, it's, it's the future hope of all that God has promised. And because it's, it's based on what Jesus has already done for us, our hope is a secure and guaranteed hope. That's what it's explaining in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, what does your future hold for you? Is it wrath? When you finally go to meet the Lord, is that what you're looking forward to? Is God going to send you to your eternal punishment because of your sins? Because that's what we deserve, isn't it? But actually, no, through Jesus Christ, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, for all those who have repented and believed in him, we will not face God's wrath. And this is the good news. But more than that, we are destined, he says, to receive salvation. Just think about that for a second. We are destined to receive salvation. And you might think, well, hang on a minute. I thought I already was saved. <laughs> what do you mean I'm going to receive salvation? I thought I had that now. Well, the Bible speaks about salvation as something that, that has taken place in the past. So we have been saved. It also speaks about salvation as something that is in the present. So we are being saved. It also speaks about salvation as being something in the future. So we will be saved. And so here, although we have been saved because of what Jesus has done in the past, and we are currently being saved, we've been made more like Jesus, sanctified, uh, we won't come into all that our salvation is, all that it means for us until that final day uh, when Jesus returns. That is where you are going if you believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 10, at the end of that, he says, that we might live with him. This is our hope, isn't it? That we might live with him. And in case, in case all of that isn't enough, because of what Jesus has done, verse 10, doesn't matter whether you are awake or asleep. Again, this is metaphorically speaking. Paul isn't really concerned whether we're actually physically sleeping or not. He's talking about whether we are dead or alive at the point when Jesus returns. What he's saying is something really similar to Romans chapter 8. He's saying, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Except here, he just says, whether we're living or dead, when Jesus returns, we shall be with him. We've got to get that. That is our hope. We shall be with 
him. Whatever else happens, we shall be with him. This is the helmet of hope. These are the promises that we strap over our hearts and put over our heads. Jesus is coming back and no matter what, we will be with him. So we are to live in the light of this. We are to protect ourselves with these wonderful truths and, and the rock solid hope that we have. Most of us already know this, don't we? But how quickly we lose that excitement, that thrill, that, that joy of what we have to look forward to. How quickly, when we walk out that door, the world tries to steal our hope and our joy and those thoughts of where we're going and everything else. But we need to hold on to this, this hope that we've got uh, to remember we are going to be with him forever. This is one of the truths that keeps us going through the drain, daily trudgery and hardship and moves us on towards a, a, a obedience. We remember Jesus is coming back soon. But this isn't an individual thing. Well, it is an individual thing, but it's not just an individual thing. What we have in Jesus, that should massively impact the way we are with our Christian brothers and sisters too. So we remember Jesus is coming back soon. But our final point then is, so build one another up then. In the light of that, build one another up then. Get each other ready. So we get to our verse. Finally, uh, verse 11, uh, uh, with, he starts with the word, therefore. And that's why we spent time looking back therefore what well therefore since jesus is returning you have this hope of a future and that you will be with him verse 11 therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing so there's two things there one encourage one another and two build one another up so first encourage one another what does that mean well, notice this is a relational thing. He's not saying, Matt, encourage yourself. Although sometimes we do have to do that, don't we? And it's right to give yourself a good talking to sometimes, as the psalmist does in Psalm 42, verse 5. Why are you cast down, O soul? We have to talk to ourselves sometimes, don't we? But not here. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying, encourage one another. Obviously, this means that we need to be together. I can't encourage you if I'm never with you, and you can't encourage me if you're never with me, can you? And this is why we all need to be looking out for those who are missing at this time. This is why we all need to be reaching out to those who are not meeting with us. I wonder if you've noticed there's someone that's missing that you haven't seen on Zoom or physically, and you just think, I wonder what, what's happened to them. You know, we're not to get all condemning and lay guilt trips on each other, but we, we do need to reach out in love and, and carefully and lovingly and kindly. We need to help each other in this. We need to encourage each other. We need each other. You know, if I think that my faith is just a private thing, and I don't need anyone else, you know, I'm a strong believer, I don't need to go to church or whatever else, that clearly goes against what God is saying here, doesn't it? Because actually, how can, anyone, how can I encourage anyone if I don't see anyone? How can you encourage me if, if you're never with me? So we, are to, we, we need to obey this. We need to be together in some manner, in some way, we need to be able to do this to encourage and help each other, don't we? And if we withdraw from that, then not only do we lose out from the encouragement we can get from other people, uh, I'm not going to be, we're not going to be able to encourage those people that need us. Uh, this isn't about laying guilt trips on anyone or to overload people saying you've got to come to, you know, X amount of meetings and it doesn't matter what life is like, you've just got to be there because that's what counts. You know, we're not to be meeting orientated, we're to be people orientated. That's what matters, not meetings, but people. But it does give us reason to think about our meeting together, doesn't that? You know, how am I going to be at the service? Should I be at the prayer meeting? Should I be at the home group? How can I help someone? Well, what does it actually mean to encourage someone? <clears throat> it's, it's lovely when someone steps out of their comfort zone, isn't it? You know, they, 
they pray or they read or they do something or serve in some way and, and you want to encourage them hopefully we are the kind of church that says you know well done that was really good to see you doing that and that's really good to encourage each other like that uh, but i think the encouragement that paul's talking about here is it uh, it goes deeper than just a well done in view of, in view of what he's just said it is to encourage people to keep on going in their faith. So in chapter 4, verse 1, it's encouraging each other to live in a way that pleases God. In chapter 5, verse 16, it's helping people to rejoice and to pray. Look, come on, brother, you, I, I've noticed you look so miserable when you praise the Lord. You know, can, can we talk about that? Can I help you? You know, I've noticed you, you never seem to pray. How is your prayer life? Can we, you know, it's just uh, chapter 1, verse 16 is modeling what it is to live for the Lord. So other people can look at us and, and learn. So you see, it's much more than just a caring compliment, as good and right as that is. It's encouraging each other to, to follow Jesus. Come on, sister. Let's, let's pray about your problems together. Let's pray about my problems together. Let's go and have a chat about it. Let's help each other. Let's shoulder the weight together. You're not alone. You don't have to go through this alone. Why do we need this help? Because it can be cut so hard, can't it? So much in this world clouds our vision of the Lord and what we have in him. His return can see as, seem as distant as that thief in the night. Like, oh, yeah, it might happen one day, but I just, I, you know, I can't even think about that right now. So we're to encourage each other to keep going, to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, to work his word deep into our lives. So it's, it's just part of us. So we're submitting ourselves to him. That's why home groups I think is so important actually in our discipleship because we get the chance to talk about this together we get the chance to explore what was said on the sunday to apply it to think about it to see how that's going to work out in our everyday lives it is our calling to help each other it is our calling to encourage each other in the faith one of David Attenborough's recent documentaries, um, there was this uh, episode where there's this big herd of mus muscocks, I think they're called, strange creatures. They were big, hairy, ox-type creatures, um, really sort of big and, and furry. And, and then there were these um, arctic wolves, and they obviously wanted to eat one of these muscocks creatures. And so they were trying to separate the herd so they could take one of these prized pieces of meat uh, for their dinner and they were sort of agitating the herd coming in and coming out and and the herd was sort of responding some of the more um, bullish ones were coming out to meet the the, the uh, wolves and then one got separated and he sort of began to run away he realized he was in danger he began to run away but he tripped he fell he was over and the wolves started to come upon him but then the herd saw and they came to his rescue. They sort of piled in and all the wolves scattered and got out of there. There was no dinner that night. We are in a spiritual war. The enemy has many tricks to try and divert our attention from the Lord. And one of them is to separate us from each other, from the body. Because he knows when we are alone, we are much more vulnerable. We need each other. We are to be a means of God's grace to each other. He's given us to each other to be a blessing, to help each other, to encourage each other, to keep going. We're not to just keep going, and just be doing maintenance work. We are actually to be building one another up. That's the second part of verse 11, isn't it? Build one another up. What does that mean? It means to help each other grow. To help strengthen one another in the Lord. To help each other become more like Jesus. To help each other get to know him more. To add what is missing in each other's faith to model what it looks like to live for the Lord, even when we're not in ideal circumstances. I know you're struggling, brother, but look, this is, I struggle too, and, and look, I can help you in this. 
This is 14 to 15 go on to show more of what's involved in helping each other carry on and build each other up. Um, so maybe read through those again in your own quiet times. Uh, but quickly now we just whiz through them. So admonish the idol. There were some brothers in that church that were being idle. They were being actually quite disruptive. Um, and so there's the idea that correction would be needed. That's that's part of helping each other, encouraging each other, building each other up is, is correcting one another. When there's a blind spot in our faith, in our, in our life, in our walk, is actually coming alongside each other and saying, do you know, it's, it's not very helpful what you're doing there. But also to encourage the faint hearted to help the weak. We are a body. We can't just ignore it. And one of us is struggling like that big hairy ox. I'm not calling you big hairy oxes, but, you know, you get the picture. Uh, the herd, the church must gather around and help each other, pick each other up. It's not always easy, is it? Because we don't always want help. We can be too proud. We think people are having a go at us when they come alongside us to, to help us. But, but, you know, we are to do this. We graciously, kindly, lovingly help each other. And then we know it's going to be difficult. There's going to be some difficult times, some difficult conversations. Not everyone's going to get it. Not everyone's going to want our help. And even when we offer the help, sometimes it'll be rejected. And so he says, he gives this characteristic call for patience. Oh, he keeps having to tell us about patience, doesn't he? We know we need this. So he says, you know, be patient with each other. And again, all this requires relationship, it requires time. It requires being together. It's going to require personal sacrifice because to build relationships means spending time with each other. And we need to be intentional about this. So perhaps this means not necessarily just waiting for the opportunity when you see an obvious need. Maybe it means we need to be more proactive about this, thinking, well, you know that person, yeah, I, how can I build them up? Maybe we need to be thinking, uh, who's struggling in the church? How can I help them? Not how can you help them and you help them. How can I help them? Sunday services are usually a good time to do this. It's hard at the moment, so we need to be creative in how we can do it otherwise. We need to meet in home groups. We maybe do one-to-ones. Again, it's difficult in our current circumstances, but one-to-ones are a brilliant way of doing this, of helping each other grow in the Lord. Maybe forming a prayer triplet. Can't do it now, but just bear this in mind. You know, how, how do we approach church? Do we come to church thinking, you know, what am I going to get out of church? What's church going to give to me? What are they going to do for me this week? Rather, should we not be thinking, how am I going to help? How am I going to encourage? How am I going to build up those around me, those people that I know are struggling, those people I never talk to? How am I going to bless them? It's hard at the moment, but don't worry, I'm going to keep banging this drum for as long as you keep me here uh, so that we don't forget. Um, we need to be encouraging each other, building each other up. And I'm planting the seed here. It would be so good for the spiritual health of this church if we could just regularly, even just regularly meet with one other believer with the sole purpose of encouraging them, building them up in their faith. This isn't my idea. <laughs> this is Paul's idea. He's saying, encourage them, build them up. I know the thought of that fills some of us with real terror. We think, I can't, I, I wouldn't know what to do. I wouldn't know what to say. But actually, the revelation is, actually, we don't need a degree in theology. We just need to know and love the Lord. He's, he's dealt with you, hasn't he? He saved you, hasn't he? He's been teaching you things. Well, that's a start. We just need to know and love the Lord. Uh, what, what a help it could be for a young mum to meet with a more mature believing woman and to learn how that older woman coped with all the demands of life and all the, 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 the busyness and still come out following the Lord. Perhaps there's younger people in our congregation just think, I don't know how I can cope. And there's an older person who can come in and say, well, look, this is how. Let me help you. Let me support you. Let me pray for you. What about if there's young men in our fellowship, surely they need older guys to come in and to chat through. What does it mean to be a man of God? You know, the world's saying to be a man, you need to be da da da. So do we not we need to be saying, actually, this is what you need to be. This is what a man of God looks like. 
how valuable it would be for newer believers to meet with older believers to be taught, this is how you read your Bible. This is how you pray. This is what it looks like to live a life that follows Jesus. I'm not talking about formal lessons. Uh, I'm just talking about you open your Bible to, together. You read a passage and you go, well, what do you think that means? Well, I don't know. Do, do you, and you just talk about it and you work it through. You pray it through. You think it through. You sort of share your struggles and you see how the Bible speaks into it. You share your victories. And mentoring someone isn't about saying, I'm perfect. I've got it all together. Look at me, you know, and, and you'll be all right. It's saying, actually, no, this is a struggle. We need each other. Let me help you. And actually, as I mentor you, you'll be helping me as well. I tell you what, if we get this as a church, if we take verse 11 seriously, if we seek to encourage each other and to build each other up, this will be a different church in a few years' time. It will be completely different. Maybe some of us are already doing this. And that's great. That's what the Thessalonians were already doing. He says at the end of verse 11, he says, just as you are doing. Paul knows there's some really good stuff going on. And I know there's some really good stuff going on in this church too. But Paul wanted more. So do we, don't we? We want to grow. We want to mature. We want to see every disciple discipling another it seems scary, but this is what a family does. All of us helping each other to follow Jesus and to follow him better. If you leave it to just me, if you leave it to just the elders, it's going to be like that snowball. It's just too heavy. I can't do it. But when in obedience to God's word, we all lift together good things, perhaps great things, Perhaps even glorious things could happen here as we obey God's word. Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your words to us. We thank you for the challenge it is. And yet, Lord, we know it is for our good that you tell us these things. It's not to put guilt trips on us. It's not to make us feel bad, Lord. It's so that the church, your body, can be built up and blessed and become stronger as we all play our part. So, Lord, help us to take your word seriously. Help us to consider, what can I do? How can I help? How can I encourage? How can I build someone else up? Lord, help us to do this. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.